Dr. The Honorable Lovell Francis, Minister of State in the Ministry of Education. Justice Anthony Lucky, Tribunal Judge, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, Atlas. A special welcome to Judge James L. Kateka, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. I have heard so much about you from Justice Lucky. Glowing words of tribute and appreciation for your competence and your intellect. Judge James L. Kateka, again, in fact, also um, just Judge Thomas Hyder, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Judge Thomas, um, um, again, I've heard a lot about you and, and the respectful tone and consideration that has that have always attracted comments by Justice Lucky about you and your how you dispose of your matters and the kind of critical analysis that you bring to your judgments. Mr. Colin Young, International Maritime Organization Regional Advisor. Commander Wina Moore, Commander, Commanding Officer, Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard. Mr. Gerald Thompson, former Ambassador of Trinidad and Tobago to the United Nations and someone again, who I have admired over the years, having worked with you when I was in the DPP's office, when we were engaging the Venezuelan Coast Guards on issues, on maritime issues, and the kind of wisdom you brought to those discussions. Professor Clema Embia, Deputy Chairman of the Board of Governors and members of the Board of Governors, UTT. Sir, again, I have to thank you very much for the clarity of vision you continue to bring to this great organization and done so with the required passion. Lieutenant Commander Ronald Alfred, Director, Maritime Services Division, Ministry of Works and Transport. Dr. Haman Juman, Deputy Director, Research Institute of Marine Affairs. Professor Diana Reinsing, President of UTT. Again, Professor, again, you know, you're a dynamo. You continue to, to be an energizer. Uh, and we do thank you and appreciate the fact that you're prepared to assist all and sundry in achieving the purpose and object of UTT. Ms. Indira Chedi, Legal Counsel, Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Dr. Lona Innes, Coordinator, UNAP Caribbean Envi Environment Program. Mr. Danford Mapp, Manager of Business and Technical Support, National Energy Corporation. Sir, again, I, I have heard laudable statements about the role of NEC in the context of this particular forum. And it tells, it speaks to a concept, a, a philosophy of corporate social responsibility that goes beyond the buying of football jerseys in communities. I dare say um, it is heartening to see corporate social responsibility assuming philosophical proportions and getting into real issues that can only lead to a better and greater society. So thank you very much for that. Ms. Mrs. Vivian Rambarat Parsam, Assistant Professor and Program Leader, Maritime Studies UTT. Students and faculty of UTT's Maritime Students Studies Program. Representatives of the Ministry of Works and Transport. Representatives of the maritime sector. Specially invited guests, members of the media, Ladies and gentlemen, you know, Dr. Lovell Francis, when you spoke just a while ago, I had to commend you for bringing that human face to the issue that would be engaging this particular forum. And I say so because I quietly recall when we were singing our anthem, we were speaking about islands of the Blue Caribbean Sea. And I too can associate with your pain in the context of the ecological degradation taking place. Of course, being from a rural district myself and having to travel to college in San Fernando and the port of Spain, and passing in front of the Gulf of Paria. A Gulf of Paria that was once a beautiful place. 
44 years ago as a student, it was blue. It's no longer blue. In the same way that the Caroni River, though brown, was clear. It is no longer clear. In like manner that the Godino River that runs into the wetlands of the south are getting bronger and bronger. So when you speak about the trials and tribulations of the fishermen, I can relate to that because sometimes when I go down to Otaheite to buy fish, one of my favorite fisher, fisher folk, Sandra, I would see those shrimps. And I'd say, you know, Sandra, I believe those shrimps can talk Spanish. <laughs> Only because it is a recognition that the shrimps that were in great abundance in our wetlands are no more. And as a result, our fishermen go down the main to get the shrimps that they require. So I want to congratulate the visionaries in this audience here, the University of the Trinidad and Tobago, the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard, and especially Justice Anthony Lucky, who has approached this project with the committed passion of a teenager now entering school at Presentation College, San Fernando. And I like that, that passion, that heart. Because you almost remind me of one of my favorite politicians in the United States who ran against Hillary Clinton, who at the age of 74 was displaying the brain of a 25-year-old. So I want to thank you very much, sir, for keeping the feet, keeping the focus, and more particularly, being able to garner the expertise that we have in this small auditorium, all with a view to advancing the cause of a better world through ocean governance. So we have here the cognizant in the field of ocean governance and those interested in the well-being of the seas. Again, I have to pay homage to the TNT Coast Guard for their efforts in ensuring the protection of the borders and seas of this republic. The Coast Guard, you all form part of that distinguished corps of military men and women with a noble and honorable task of protecting the citizenry of this great republic and securing the well-being of our oceans. The convening of this symposium on enhancing ocean governance in the Caribbean is a most welcome development. It comes at a time when greater international attention is being focused on the development of new rules to improve ocean governance globally, or calls for the full and effective implementation of existing rules which flow from legally binding obligations under various international legal instruments to which all Caribbean countries are state parties. The primary one being, of course, the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It is timely that attention is being drawn to the implementation of the outcome of the United Nations Conference, the Ocean Conference, to support the implementation of Sustainable Development Goal Number 14, conserve and sustainable use of the oceans and seas and marine resources for sustainable development, which took place at the United Nations headquarters in New York from the 5th to the 9th of June, 2017, where heads of state and government and other high-level representatives and members of civil society agreed to commitments which are geared towards reversing the decline and deterioration besetting our oceans and seas. In speaking at the said ocean conference, the Honorable Isabella Lovin, Minister for International Development and Climate of Sweden, said, and I quote, I truly believe this conference will constitute the game changer we so desperately need. Now the work really begins to save our oceans, end of quote. 
In adopting the outcome document, referred to as a call for action, all 193 member states of the UN agreed to a set of measures to reverse the decline of the sea. I share the optimism of Minister Lovin, and I'm encouraged that the entire UN family adopted such a progressive and ambitious outcome document. But would a conference really constitute the game changer as it is hoped for by the Swedish minister? It certainly can be a catalyst. We can ensure that the resources of our oceans and seas within and beyond national jurisdictions are conserved and sustainably used for the benefit of current and future generations in keeping with the principles of inter and intergenerational equity. However, the critical work has to be done in order to achieve this noble objective of enhancing ocean governance, which would have the consequential effect of reversing ocean decline. Political leadership and political will must be demonstrated by all nations. For example, to ensure that state parties to the convention honor their obligations to protect and preserve the marine environment in keeping with the provisions of Article 192 of that instrument. The intolerable decay in our marine environment is a wake-up call, a call to give full effect to the constitution of our oceans and seas, that is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. More than 30 years after the opening for signatures of the convention in Montego Bay, in our sister CARICOM state of Jamaica, many state parties have exercised their rights to exploit their natural resources in respective marine areas in accordance with Article 193 of the Convention without, and I state, without the same enthusiasm to implement the provisions of Article 192 to safeguard the environment from destructive anthropogenic activities. The result of this flagrant disregard to adhere to the stipulations under the Convention which a large majority of states have accepted as customary international law, has not only undermined ocean governance, but has led to an increasing incidence of, for example, coral bleaching, which is affecting our coral reefs in Tobago, Bahamas, and the Cayman Islands, and the rise in ocean acidification in different jurisdictions. The question is therefore how we reverse these activities which are injurious to our marine ecosystem. The answer lies in collective action on the part of members of the international community, as we saw at the Ocean Conference a couple of weeks ago. This must be buttressed by strong, implementable legislative action in all states to enforce international obli obligations, whether they emanate from, this, from soft law instruments, such as the annual omnibus resolution on oceans and the law of the sea, and legally binding obligations from the 1994 Agreement on the Implementation of Part 11 of the Convention, or the 1995 Agreement on Straddling and Highly Migratory Fish Stocks. I submit that if urgent action is not taken to address the depletion of fish stock stocks, destructive fishing practices, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, IOU fishing, there is a danger that we might not achieve SDG 14, which is part of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. The Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, they have stated that 30% of the global catch, amounting to some 11 to 26 million tons, representing monies in the sum of 10 to 23 trillion dollars, that all these are the result of illegal fishing. And the countries that they are affecting adversely are developing states and SIDs, small island developing states. In the Caribbean, action must be taken in real terms and I listened to the perpetual cry of Mr. Aboud to tackle IUU fishing from foreign long-line fishing vessels, according to reports of the Food and Agricultural Organization. It is one of the major threats to the sustainability 
of the Caribbean fishery resources. Within the region, there have been positive signs of attempts to enhance ocean governance through the adoption of the Common Fisheries Policy to combat IUU fishing. I applaud this significant regional effort, but wish to indicate that without cooperation among states to implement that agreement, we would continue to witness the decline in fish stocks and the concomitant effects of loss of revenue for fisher folk in the region exacerbate food insecurity and undermine rural communities which depend on the fishing industries for their survival. We look to the day when the children of Moruga sitting in their classrooms can look out and see fishermen on the shoreline fishing and not having to go out hundreds of miles. Any discourse on enhancing ocean governance in the Caribbean or elsewhere would be grossly incomplete if the effects of climate change in our maritime areas are not addressed. In this regard, it should be noted that all CARICOM states have either signified or ratified the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and therefore due regard must be shown to the relevant parts of the Paris Agreement Climate Agreement, which notes that it is important to ensure the integrity of all ecosystems, including oceans. I do recall the clarion call of crisis that Ambassador Blake made to us heads of state at our last conference in Antigua, when she stated that in 50 years time, some 240 odd tourist destinations, income earning entities would be underwater in 50 years time. So that as much as in fact persons engage in small term, mid term, and long term initiatives, we need initiatives that engage the urgency of now. Now, any discourse on enhancing ocean governance must run parallel and with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change in, in, in a very proactive manner. Indeed, if we are to enhance ocean governance, steps must be taken in keeping with our commitments under the said Paris Agreement to ensure that excess heat and carbon dioxide do not continue to alter the physics, chemistry, and ecology of the oceans, which research has shown has affected valuable ecosystem services such as fisheries, coastal tourism, and coastal protection. I also wish to indicate that many years before the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCCC, was adopted, the founding fathers of the convention, which included the late Lennox Bala, former diplomat and jurist from Trinidad and Tobago, recognized the need to codify measures aimed at monitoring the risk or effects of pollution on the environment. Again, an, examin exa an examination of state practice, which showed that there has been an implementation deficit of Article 204 of the Convention, which calls on states, and I quote, to observe, measure, evaluate, and analyze by recognized scientific methods the risk and effects of pollution on the marine environment, end of quote. Nevertheless, there has also been some positive developments insofar as scientists from developing countries participating in marine scientific research in the area beyond national jurisdiction, which is the common heritage of mankind, through the work being done by the International Seabed Authority through its endowment fund for the purpose of facilitating the participation of scientists from developing countries in marine research in the area. I have been advised that scientists from Trinidad and Tobago and other CARICOM states have been beneficiaries under the scheme and I wish to congratulate previous Secretaries General of the International Seabed Authority for their work on this project and to wish Mr. Michael Ludge, the new Secretary General of the ISA, to continue the good work set by his predecessors. Over the past years as well, 
The international community has witnessed improvements in the manner in which the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, the CLCS, has conducted its work to the benefit of state parties, including Caribbean state parties, which have made submissions to the CLCS seeking to establish the outer limits of the continental shelves and are awaiting recommendations to establish the outer limits in accordance with Article 76 of the Convention. The CLCS has thus shown that its existing parent instrument, the Convention, continues to be the primary body of rules relating to this subject matter. And I wish to take this opportunity to commend the members of the CLCS, including the Venerable Mr. Francis Charles, who has served on the CLCS with distinction for 10 years, until he declined the nomination for a re-election -re and gave way to Dr. Wanda Delandro Clark, that imminent technocrat, and another national of Trinidad and Tobago, and as in fact has been mentioned by the Permanent Secretary, the first woman to be elected to the CLCS. The Convention has generally worked well as the constitution of our oceans and seas and the main body of laws and ocean governance for more than three decades. It has been recognized, however, that in some respects the general principles laid down in the Convention have to be fleshed out in order to ensure that there is full and effective implementation of its provisions in order to fill any legal or regulatory gap needed to enhance ocean governance. In this vein, I must confess that I have been following the deliberations of the Preparity Committee established by the General Assembly to make recommendations to that body on the elements of an internationally legal binding agreement under the Convention on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction. The Preparity Committee which had as its first chairman Mr. Eden Charles, former ambassador and deputy permanent representative of TNT to the United Nations, must be encouraged in its work as it is about to commence its final session before it makes recommendations to the General Assembly on the elements of a BBNJ agreement and the convening of a diplomatic conference which is expected to then elaborate on that BBNG agreement. Without the adoption of what would be the third implementing agreement under the Convention, marine biological diversity would not have the type of regulation that is so urgently necessary to ensure that the resources are conserved and suitably used for current and successive generations. The subject, enhancing ocean governance, presupposes that there is in existence a sturdy platform of ocean governance or a semblance of one in the Caribbean region. However, in the light of what is taking place, I often ponder whether our ocean governance structure can withstand those emerging blue growth strategies that embrace ocean energy, aquaculture, biotechnology, mining, and aquatourism, with offshore wind farms, tidal and wave energy, all embraced in that collaborative economic activity called the multi-use platforms at sea, MOPS. I speak of the ultimate integrated platform, purposely designed for a complex combination of activities in a shared marine space. This is what awaits us, and Europe is ahead in this regard, in finding ways and means in finding new and sustainable and e innovative economic activities through this marine initiative and infrastructure. It is not my intention to go into a treatise on blue growth and technology, but rather it is a call to arms of small island development states to get on board with, with what can holistically work in the Caribbean region. Ocean governance is such a dynamic, evolving concept, involving oversight of spatial areas, security, connectivity to the ocean needs and possibilities, control by way of guidance, service to all stakeholders, interdependence that says we are not alone, and vision, the need to go beyond our walls of indifference. Ocean governance has with it a responsibility to recognize that if systems are stagnating, then how can they be brought to life and strengthened and made dynamic? Blue growth 
walks hand in hand with blue energy. And with this growing awareness of the need to move away from fossil, fossil energy, in this conference, we must begin a real implementable dialogue on blue energy and blue growth. In another vein, throughout the Caribbean, and I'm getting into the specifics, a specific of great concern. There is a sense of rush to garner the tourist dollar in the face of declining revenues from the manufacturing sectors and those engaged in the exploration of fossil. One aspect of this rush is to increase cruise ships to the Caribbean by cruise holiday companies. It will, however, require all Caribbean countries to engage the greatest environmental vigilance. Late last year, it was reported that the American British Carnival Corporation pleaded guilty to seven charges for intentional pollution by a ship at sea. An illegal practice was reported by an engineer on board who, to his credit, resigned immediately thereafter on board the Caribbean Princess, where a so-called magic pipe was utilized to surreptitiously discharge oily waste off the coast of the UK. The evidence in the court revealed that in August 2013, there was a single discharge of 4,227 gallons of contaminated water released some 20 miles off the coast of England. The Princess Cruise Lines, as part of a plea agreement, agreed to pay $40 million penalty and agreed to submit 78 cruise ships across its eight brands to a five-year environmental compliance program overseen by a judge. The Miami U.S. State Attorney, Wilfredo Ferrer, who was involved in the case, stated, and I quote, our open seas are not dumping grounds for waste. One thing we must never do is to take our clear blue oceans for granted, end of quote. Now this is against the background of the US Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, estimating that a single 3,000 person cruise ship pumps 150,000 gallons of sewage in the ocean every week. It is a scientific fact that many of the treatment systems employed by these liners are archaic. They do not filter out nitrogen and phosphorus upon which algae feed. And with the growth of algae, there is a corresponding tripping of oxygen in the water, suffocating shellfish, corals, fish, and other sea creatures. These graphic statistics demonstrate the burgeoning crisis that awaits us in the Caribbean from the growing proliferation of cruise liners in our fragile Caribbean marine environment. We therefore need appropriate legislation with appropriate heavy financial sanction to prevent such environmental violations by the dumping of waste in the Caribbean Sea. The coral decay taking place in the Caribbean is phenomenal. What is interesting in this particular matter involving the Princess Cruises is that it was revealed, and I quote, illegal practices were found on four other Princess ships, including use of clean ocean water to fool onboard center sensors that will otherwise detect the illegal dumping of contaminated bilge water, end of quote. The authorities revealed that the cost savings was the motive and that the ship officers and crew conspired to cover up what was going on. With the widening of the Panama Canal, there are indeed benefits that will accrue to the Caribbean region. There is, however, that added risk that attempts will be made by metropole countries to have possibly radioactive waste shipments passing through the Caribbean waters. Ocean governance on this issue must be regional and fully harmonized. The CARICOM must remain steadfast in its resolve to preempt such intrusions and the risk of a catastrophic accident taking place. In July 2011, 
the then CARICOM chairman and then prime minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, aptly summed it up when he stated, and I quote, CARICOM vehemently condemns as unacceptable and injurious the practice by the UK, France, and Japan of transporting hazardous waste to the sea, thus risking the very existence of the people of the Caribbean, end of quote. I do hope that this conference recognizes the existing dynamic and potential in marine spatial planning, that there will be this undying commitment to invoke best practices and international benchmark standards in the exploration and utilization of our seas, and that countries recognize the importance of our interdependence, and that whatever we do must redound to the benefit of not some, but all. I have certain expected outcomes and outputs from this particular conference. I would hope for a more comprehensive understanding by the technocrats and government officials of the multifaceted issues to be addressed in the short term, mid term, long term, and more particularly now. And the part and recognize the part played, continue to be played by institutions, NGOs, and individuals involved in a just cause of ocean governance in all sectors of our society, in the Caribbean and in the world. It is my hope that the various international instruments at the heart of maritime policies and regulations in the region be the subject of immediate implementation at institutional and at administrative level. Again, it is my hope that this conference will further sensitize us, member states, of possibly looking into the augmentation of the role and importance of blue economy and growth with blue energy. And more importantly, that apart from all these suggestions, all these illusions, that there must be one core nerve in your discussions, and that is in dealing with the topic at hand, that we continue to ensure that our perennial motive is the supremacy of environmental integrity in ocean governance. Thank you very much.